On my door, a dull brass plate says, Private Detective. The few friends I have call me Carnby. The others call me The Reptile. I don't care to think what my banker calls me. These days, I leave my letters unopened. Bills and threats to send in the receivers just ruin my day. When an antique dealer called Gloria Allen contacted me, I slipped into my best shirt, holstered my thirty-eight, and got to her shop as fast as I could. I was expecting something sordid. Blackmail, probably. Boy, was I wrong. What I was asked to do was visit a property called Dersetto and find a piano in the loft. It was an old piano with secret drawers, the kind people who buy stuff in antique stores go crazy over. The Dersetto house is supposed to be piled high with classy junk, furniture, books, paintings. It looked like whoever owned Dersetto was about to get cleaned out. I was going to bring up the subject of money when Gloria Allen handed me a hundred and fifty dollars and a key. I kept myself from grinning at the thought of my banker's surprise. He doesn't like his victims getting away. I looked over a copy of the police report. The former owner of Dersetto a guy called J. Hartwood had hanged himself in the loft. The coroner concluded it was a clear-cut case of suicide. I promised Gloria Allen I'd give the place a look over. My report will be ready in a couple of days. I've been reading up on the history of the old house. It's the kind of place ghosts run away from in terror. Grisly murders, curses, lunacy. <laughs> Luckily, devil worship makes me smile, so this is my idea of a paid vacation.
The Creatures of Night by Hubertus the Bald Translated from Latin by his brother in prayer, Fratre Johann Marcus Of Monstrosity You who read me know that night engenders monsters and that night creatures exist. The accursed book of Abdul al-Hazred is clear on this matter. That is not dead which can eternal lie. Unhappy he who knows that book. Unhappy he whose eyes alight upon that foulest of texts. Unhappy he who implores the standing stones. For he will free the powers of darkness. Of the pit. Stagnant waters are like the memory of men. Beneath the surface calm, clawed beasts await and are known to initiates as the deep ones. Awaiting his prey, the deep one seizes him and drags him down to the abyss, where Dagon, the cruel god, swims and reveres him whose name may not be pronounced of libraries. Unhappy he who frees the prowler, unhappy he who meets the prowler erring among the books. He generates the vagabond that comes from other spheres. He believes the vagabond does not exist. He will feel the embrace of death, for in the eyes of the vagabond books are no more than dreams stone no more than wind the vagabond knows how to take the breath of the reckless of strife he who speaks does not know and believes he is able to kill the creatures of the night folly evil is conjured up by science and secrecy he who prowls among books will perish by the blade. He who flies in the dark caverns will scream in fear. He who swims in the depths will evaporate. But he who believes he knows, knows nothing. He who knows, says nothing. Of death. There are domains more terrible than death. That is not dead which can eternal lie. Each creature is conjured up and is not dead, but returns to the origins. A monster, a science. Steel kills the vagabond who never dies. Translator's Note here ends the manuscript of Hubertus, who died in the library of the convent of Teruela in the year of our Lord, 1666. Requiescat in pace.
Juan Luis Jorge, De Biblioteca, Reflections on the Power of the Verb in Certain Texts, Archaeos Publications, 1919, Stafford. Translation does not alter the occult power contained within such forbidden texts. The malevolent energy is in no way diminished. The spell must be cast aloud and clearly in certain languages or little-known dialects. Maglafach Fathang. The reader will understand that, in the light of these revelations, I would be foolhardy to continue quoting from the text I have before me. If spoken aloud in its entirety, it would surely awaken powerful and malignant forces. I will go further and say that simple reading of some of the more technical passages describing specific practices is in itself a perilous exercise. The ill-prepared reader can easily fall prey to attacks of demented hysteria, not unlike those described in cases of individuals said to be possessed by evil spirits. I recommend the study made by Zempf, Urbain, Grandier, and Loudon, and the reports made by the Reverend Richard Price concerning a number of astonishing, to say the least, exorcisms carried out in a parish near Providence. Given what I have written, we must be grateful to the librarians of the British Museum who have never allowed consultation of the work of Al-Azib's startling work, the infamous Necronomicon. Copies of that work do exist, in spite of the zeal of book-burning inquisitors. For proof, we need look no further than the British Museum, of course, and the sealed archives of the Miskatonic University in Arkham. Other examples of books whose evil can be unleashed by any thoughtless reader are von Jutz's von Unersprechlichen Kulten and the abominable the Vermis Mysteries by Ludwig Prin, whose sordid death should be a lesson to all those tempted by a study of the occult. The Sacrificial Dagger, Otto Stern, Lumina Books. The importance placed on ritual sacrifice is constant in religious cult practice. Propitiating the gods is a theme common to many religions. The Old Testament affords many examples. Primitive polytheistic belief systems integrate sacrifice in their rituals as part of the recurrent process of reaffirmation and, naturally enough, group cohesion. The members of their social and religious community come together in an act of purification and atonement. It would be erroneous to imagine the act of human sacrifice, linking priest, offering and God, C.F. Manzetti, Stone Courts, as anything less than a vital focusing of the group's faith. The act also ensures the continuing appeasement of the God.
but only if practiced by a recognized officiating priest using the appropriate instrument. Studies made concerning primitive religious groups bear witness to the central role of sacrifice in living ritual. My own work in the field of ethnopsychology brought me into contact with a sorcerer living in the region of Arkham. He introduced me to the rite of steel, linked to a ceremony known as adoring the black goat of the woods with a thousand youngs. The god, being adored, is known as the vagabond. Here, the dagger's roar, which allows the life breath to pass from one dimension to another, is essential. The vagabond is a frightening figure, being able to move where he wants and to kill those who have displeased the goat guard, for whom he acts as a go-between. The goat is clearly a fertility god. The priest, having spoken the invocation, must choose the appropriate dagger for the sacrifice. The knife with a sinusoidal blade that must be dipped seven times on night when the moon is full, in water that has been distilled a hundred times, will be laid aside, since it would send the vagabond back into his own dimension. See illustration. The priest will rather choose the dagger with a curved blade. That is more appropriate for slitting of the lamb's throat. This act transfigures the sorcerer priest and plunges the assembled worshippers into a divine trance. The Book of Yael, Signs of Stone, Eucharistic Rituals of Forbidden Cults, Texts Collated by Monsignor Vachet, Legate in the Curia of the Vatican. Numerous devilish cults speak of monstrous creatures called the Old Ones. These supernatural beings are believed to be possessed of powers equivalent to those of the gods of antique religions. Adepts of such cults refer to forbidden literature in order to cause these frightful entities to appear before them. What serious student of folk myths has not come across the names of Cthulhu and Shub Nigurath? It must be said that these creatures wield tremendous power and are difficult to control once they have been unleashed into the world. Those who serve he who goes in shadows protect themselves with signs of stone carved into the walls of houses or engraved on various objects. For those misguided servants of evil, the best protection appears to be that afforded by the sign of the most ancient gods. Engraved in Manar stone, a heavy material said to be disagreeable to the touch. The sinful practices of those who fall into such errors can only lead to the darkest of despair and are a mortal danger to the soul. Such monsters as those invoked by these foolhardy individuals are engendered when reason drops its guard. Man is easily tempted into perversion. It is why we must forever remain alert and renounce Satan with each breath we take. His ways are infinite in number.
Diary of Jeremy Hartwood September 27th, 1924 I have decided to keep this diary. Too many inexplicable events have taken place recently. Never have dreams so haunted my every waking moment. <laughs> Perhaps my romantic mind was too dull and has only now woken up to these new paths and visions. Some, seeing my recent paintings, may question my sanity. I can only ask them, what is sanity? Where does madness begin? September 28, 1924. The night is pitch black. I am again drenched in sweat. I was wandering in the dunes, among giant standing stones. They were arranged in a circle, and the wind whistled about them. I plunged my hand into the soil and felt that repulsive thing which was trying to catch me. It seized me. I struggled to break free of its loathsome embrace and managed to tear my hand away. It was covered in sticky substance. I was gripping a knife. October 5th, 1924. The stone circle is a pentacle. Der Seto's library is filled with books on the occult. I will study those books until I find some explanation for the dreams. The visions that haunt me must be connected to my discoveries. I shall have to undertake a profound exploration of my dreams. December 16th. Dear God, I have found the knife. It was hidden here and what I have learned fills me with apprehension. It is a sacrificial dagger belonging to some unholy cult. The thought of that blade tearing through human flesh horrifies me, yet I must continue my research. Der Seto is a storehouse of treasures. Was my father right after all? January 23rd. I spend all my days plunged in dusty books. The servants are convinced I am mad. At night, I awaken them with my screams. The dreams are draining what sanity I still have. I have tried staying awake, but in vain. My visions have changed. No doubt the influence of my father's research. February 7th, 1925. The Dark Man, that is what I call him, has revealed his true face to me. He appeared, as usual, near the fireplace. But this time, he approached me. His terrible smile will haunt me to my dying day. His breath was ice and his burning eyes froze me. I could not move. I know, as surely as I have ever known anything, that the face I saw, the face that has turned my nights into hellish torture, is the mask of death. March 10th. My exhaustion is beyond description. The endless reading burns my eyes. It seems that pirates frequented the area. Dr. Herbert insists I keep to my bed. I have moved to another bedroom and sleep much better now. The dark man has not gone, however. I know it. He will wait for as long as he must. Unless I, Jeremy Hartwood, can find a way to send him back to whatever hell he comes from. March 11th. My poor knowledge of Greek and Latin is a serious handicap to my reading. I have, nevertheless, made a great step forward. I drew the symbol on the floor. He can no longer go there. I want him to understand that I can do the same thing in my bedroom. I can imagine his rage and frustration. Only last night he found his way back into my dreams. March 13th. The translation will seriously dent what money I have left. I cannot paint. My pictures are clearly the work of a lunatic. The collector Thornhill's embarrassed smile was proof of that. March 29th. He has come back. He found the door to my dreams. I am too weary to attempt any defense. 
I have no strength left to fight, and he knows it. He considers me dead already. Could I possibly? March 30th. How ironic! The cave my father sought for so many years is here, beneath the house. Wait, the butler discovered a crack in the cellar wall. A breeze blows in through it, icy and repugnant. I am filled with horror at the thought of my father dying in this place. I will carry to my grave the vision of his face contorted in the agony of that fatal heart attack. His body was twisted. He had wept. His fingernails were torn and bloody from scrabbling at the floor. Dr. Gray concluded that death had been due to a heart attack. It was Waits, who some time later was informed that my poor father had in fact bitten off his tongue and choked on his own blood. March 31st. I explored the caverns in a dream. The dark man came with me. Strangely, I felt almost well. How can I describe what I saw? No, what words are capable of explaining such evil? I realized that my death was of no interest to him. The dark man wants something else. He seeks a body. His avid servants are now free. I am the cause. <laughs> it is almost funny. A curse is on Dersetto. From the foundations to the very rooftop, I can no longer struggle, let alone eradicate the evil that grips the house. The end is very near. I can feel it. I have taken the decision to... <laughs> May he who finds this diary pray for my soul.
The Tale of Captain J.W. Norton of the Army of the Union. 1862. The South was in collapse. Louisiana was open to us. I had each day to requisition victuals for our troops, and was aided in this endeavor by a score of brave men. Rebels were not yet ready to lay down their arms. The region was far from safe. I headed further and further west, and questioned many freed slaves. From them, I learned of a plantation on the coast. Its name was Dersetto. We received a less than hearty welcome. Only Pickford, the owner, behaved in a friendly manner. While my men counted cattle and grain reserves, I learned what I could from him. Man was most unusual and possessed an extraordinarily cultured mind. At nightfall, I gave orders for the men to bivouac at Dersetto. Pickford invited my second-in-command, Lieutenant Patterson, and myself to dine. And our host proved a most entertaining conversationalist. While coffee was being served, Patterson went to inspect the men's camp. The cigar Pickford offered me was so acrid that my head began to spin. I remembered campfire tales of fellow officers trapped by devilish Confederate tricks. My mind floated in a foul and dense fog, from which emerged the enlarged and deformed face of Pickford. He grinned at me. Patterson's return chased off the nightmare. I heard shouts and firing from outside and found the strength to take out my revolver. I fired three shots. Pickford fell to the floor. Patterson then helped me out of the burning house. The air was filled with smoke. We resembled a company in disorderly retreat. I saw slaves leaping into the flames of that inferno. They were trying to save Pickford's life.
Demonia Particularis, Signs and Rituals, by Heinrich Cassell, Ring Publications. The ritual of invocation demands that the officiant be pure. We have already described the complex operations to be followed in order to call those that sleep in superior dimensions. We shall, for the present, limit ourselves to the sign of mutual recognition used amongst their number by adepts of the cult of the old ones. The sign also serves as protection when in the presence of a servant of evil. The sign resembles a blessing, save that the first and little fingers are both folded beneath the thumb, whilst the second and third fingers are held up. It would appear that this sign has no effect on adepts of a certain rank with knowledge of particular secrets contained in the Corpus Demonicus. The use of such signs is not without considerable risk to the user during any attempt to call upon those from without.
Memoirs of a Lost Soul The mask must fall. You who discover this manuscript understand this. I am here at your side. I am waiting in the darkness of my crypt. Soon you will belong to me. One of my slaves wrote this document. I have lived for three centuries, and my name is Ezekiel Prakst, or Eliah Pickford. You may choose which to call me. I do not hide out of fear. My power is immense. I have sailed the seven seas. My ship, the Astarte, spread terror through all the continents. The Corsairs judged me like the Welsh judges of 1620, but they could not destroy me, and neither could the pirates. Now! I am immobilized. Damned Yankees! Witchcraft, voodoo, and the Cthulhu cult. I know them all. I have reigned and implored the stones. Only the Catonian haunts the cavern and resists me, but he dare not attack. I have need of a living body to regenerate myself. The Heartwoods managed to escape from me, but you who are reading these words, you will yield to my embrace. I hear your ragged breath <laughs> and smell the stench of your fear. I have vanquished death. I built Deceto. I know what it is to wait. Cthulhu helps me. My servants will lay you upon the sacrificial stone. My roar will rend the night. You will be mine, and I shall reign once more. <laughs> Come to me.
Ha, 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 ha. 